Hey guys, so this is a video that I've uh, wanted to do for a while and it's hopefully gonna be a pretty good primer on everything you need to know about oscilloscopes. I did one about multimeters a while back and I'm gonna try and do one about oscilloscopes but with a bit more detail this time and let's start with the very basics like <clears throat> A cathode ray oscilloscope. How do these things work? Well, I have one very small CRT uh, tube out of a very small oscilloscope and I'll try and explain exactly what goes into one of these things and let me just uh, de-expose the thing for a bit because paper is very white. So from left to right, by the way, check this out. PTB pen, pencil, sorry. Um, this is very cool. Uh, from left to right, or rather from the base to the screen, what we have in short is a filament which gets hot and heats up a cathode and that cathode starts emitting electrons which are then uh, passed through a control grid and a focusing grid and some other stuff like that and then they're accelerated by an anode to a certain degree so focus um, uh, this one would have been the brightness actually. Anyway, so grid one, let's call it grids. Grid, grid, cathode, um, anode. <clears throat> so by now we have a pretty collimated and kind of fast moving beam of electrons traveling this way. And this would be around here in the tube. So you can see there is a few electrostatic um, elements in there which help form a beam to a nice profile. Um, afterwards you can see there's a couple of pairs of deflection plates so two of them are like this and there's another two of them which are the same but we can see them uh, from the other side. So two of them are horizontal and two of them are vertical. In the case of this tube, all the connections are brought out to the base because it doesn't require a particularly high voltage. And um, the screen is on this side. And when that energetic beam of electrons hits the screen, it excites the phosphorus, which glows and makes a, a bright spot, usually green. Or blue in some very specific cases, or depends on the phosphorus. Now, <clears throat> um, if we look at the screen of an oscilloscope, which conveniently usually is divided into squares, we'll see that the beam usually moves from left to right, almost always, from here to here, and you never see the beam travel back this way. This is, um, first of all, how do you get the oscilloscope to move the beam to move from left to right. Well, you apply a sawtooth waveform to the deflection plate that looks kind of like this uh, to the horizontal ones. So we said these are the horizontal ones. And uh, at the same time as when the um, beam has to return, you pull this grid as low as possible, which blanks the screen. Basically, there's no more electrons making it through to the phosphorus. Um, and that, uh, in turn, lets you blank the screen and prevent the redraw of lines. Now, uh, the speed at which this uh, beam scans across horizontally on the oscilloscope depends on the basically the speed of how fast this ramp is going. So this is our time base. The speed at which the beam moves across the display horizontally is called the time base and it's measured in um, 
seconds per division, basically. So if we imagine that a scope has 10 horizontal divisions or whatever, um, it's one microsecond per division. Uh, time base would correspond to the B moving one division in one microsecond. And that's how you do uh, frequency measurements and time measurements with an analog oscilloscope. For the ver vertical, it's the same thing, but <clears throat> instead of um, having the plates connected to a circuit inside the oscilloscope, which you can control, you actually have the plates being driven by the input. So the input of the oscilloscope, which is a BNC, usually goes into uh, an attenuator, um, which is basically sort of like a resistor divider, but that can also do very well in AC and its frequency response is very flat. And that's um, basically got the, uh, the attenuator is there to enable you to get higher volts per division um, ranges. So it means that you get more bang for your buck when it comes to, uh, to the input. You can look at higher amplitude signals without destroying the oscilloscope. And after that, it goes into a uh, amplifier, which converts the single-ended to differential, single-ended signal from the oscilloscope into a differential. And this goes into the deflection plates. And why do you need to have a differential signal? Because um, the vertical plates need to, first of all, uh, you need to be able to control where on the screen the trace is and you need to control, um, you need to make sure that it's symmetric. So the drive to the plates has to be symmetric, but opposing. Um, that's about it. And basically driving the plates is like driving a capacitor. So it's kind of hard to do properly. Right, so we discussed about how analog oscilloscopes work. Uh, I've shown you a tube, uh, an oscilloscope tube. I've used my fancy PTB um, pencil to draw you a crude schematic and explain how an oscilloscope works. There's one more th thing regarding the triggering. So in the oscilloscope, let me actually draw it. Um, so, you're blown out again. Um, in order to be able to look at, so let's say the um, signal that you want to look at looks like this. In order to be able to see this rising edge, you need to delay the whole signal, so this entire signal, needs to be delayed by a specific time. Which means that from the BNC input of the oscilloscope, the um, signal is delayed uh, through a delay line. I'm sorry, I drew it absolutely. So I was drawing the BNC connected to the signal. So the BNC goes through a delay line, which is basically just a very long coiled piece of coax cable, but it acts as a transmission line, which is a series of inductors and capacitors. And this goes into the amplifier and stuff. And it's tapped off here in order to trigger it. And it's usually tapped off with a transformer. So. Imagine there's a single winding here and another winding here, and this goes to the triggering circuit. And the triggering circuit only does uh, one thing, which is synchronize when that sawtooth waveform starts to be drawn across the screen of the oscilloscope um, in order to help you, well, trigger, put the, um, uh, put the signal on the display where when you want it and where you want it Right, so let me move you around and show you a let's start with an analog scope and then I'll get you to a digital scope and um, We'll try and fit in some storage scopes in the meantime and other stuff like that. So um, Wait a second. I have to reorganize a bit 
Right, so the first thing we need to do is turn on the oscilloscope. And you might recognize this uh, 70, 7603 from previous hits as update or new lab gear, I forgot. So I have a probe here and we can first see that there's something going wrong. We can't see the trace very clearly and the readout, which is very nice to have, um, is worthless because we can't see it. So what we have to do is take our screwdriver and focus. And that's pretty tack sharp to my eyes at least. Right, now we've connected a probe and these oscilloscopes are kind enough to identify the fact that this is a 10 to 1 probe and when you connect it, it tells the oscilloscope, hey look, it's a 10 to 1 probe, but just the volts per division setting. And I'm going to stick it into the calibrator and what's going on here? This should be a square wave. Well, one of the first things you have to do when you use an oscilloscope is to compensate the probe. And the way I was taught to do that was first get it roughly where it should be and then I would use the position knob to move the thing so I can see it I might have gone too far it should be good and this also helps you get the focus just right if you need to but I don't think there is any chance of getting it any better than this and what we want to do is uh, get a perfect response, so no undershoot or overshoot. And it takes a bit of trying, and this is not a proper tool to do this because you want a non-conductive um, device uh, in order to, you know, not disturb the capacitor in there, the trimmer that you're adjusting, uh, but it works. So what we've done is we've turned on the oscilloscope, we focused it, and we have adjusted compensation on the probe. <clears throat> now, um, we're lucky because this is a triggered waveform, it's rock steady, it's not going anywhere. Look what happens when I do this. It's not, it's gone away. This means that the oscilloscope isn't triggered properly. Now, we could go and try and cheat our way into uh, making a trigger, but that's not very good. So we know that we're on channel 1, and this is the trigger selector. And we're triggering from channel 1, and now we have to adjust the trigger so that we get a stable waveform. Whoops. Right. And then we can do some measurements. For example, uh, we know that we're on one volt per division and we have four divisions high and that means that this uh, waveform is four volts peak to peak, which is correct. Um, now, if we go to one millisecond per division and using the position we move this thing a bit around, we can see that or actually, let's go to half a millisecond per division. Um, we can see that we're pretty much almost one whole division. It's actually, uh, if we use the vertical position, we can see that it's basically, uh, so half a microsecond, half a millisecond, uh, and then another point 0.1, point 0.2, 4, 6, and 8. So, uh, of another half a millisecond. So if you multiply that by, uh, what I'm trying to get at is that uh, each division is split into five sections. So this is another hundredth of a second, basically, um, another 0.1 milliseconds. I'm sorry, yeah, 0.1 milliseconds. And we have 0 0.5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we have 0.9 milliseconds period, which corresponds to 
a bit over a kilohertz, which is close enough. Right, now we have two major options of uh, coupling. So we either have a, uh, this is the ground, so this is where you would set your vertical position for the trace that you're interested in, because this being a two channel plugin, you can have two different inputs. Um, so let's see, I'm happy with it being in the center. Um, I can either AC couple the signal, <clears throat> which means that the signal is stripped of every any DC component it might have, or we can DC couple it. Now, as you can see, the signal starts at zero and goes to four volts, which means that it has a average value of two volts. Well, when you AC couple a signal, you basically get rid of its average value. So it dropped by two volts. This is also very useful to measure the DC offset of a um, waveform. So let me give you another example. I'm going to stick the probe in the output of the signal generator here. Actually, I should have gotten a BNC cable but we'll, ma we'll manage, we'll, we'll get it done. And it's trying to trigger because it doesn't know what's going on. So, um, let's put it Wait a second while the banana brain is working. My signal generator appears to have uh, stopped working. Yep, that looks like it's completely pooched. That's sad. Let me just try a BNC. I'll be right back. Right, so I fixed it. And now it's on channel 2. So we're going to shift the trigger to channel 2. And I shall move it so we can take a closer look at it and I don't like the frequency, it's kind of high so I'm gonna go a bit lower actually, let's go like this right okay so we have 100 microseconds per division 1 volt per division and let's look at it and see again so we'll take the waveform, put it somewhere convenient convenient again 1 volt, 2 volt, 2.2, 2.4 volts, peak to peak. Um, and when it comes to the period of the thing, uh, for any waveform, you take between two zero crossings, which would be, for example, if we look at... Um, let me put it on to ground and move it straight to ground so we don't get tricked and between two zero crossings we have one two point two divisions so the uh, 220 microseconds so one over that then you get the frequency it should be around a hundred ish kilohertz a hundred something kilohertz uh, sorry one, one point something kilohertz again um, What? I'll uh, do the math and put it in here somewhere. I am way too brain dead at this point. Um, right. What else can you do with um, an oscilloscope like this? Well, I, men I mentioned that you can measure the DC offset um, of a 
power supply uh, of a sorry of a signal right and um, if you put this on DC the cam on this thing is a bit uh, rusty crusty uh, and if we turn it down a bit because the signal generator can't output enough DC offset at high signal levels as you can see um, we can me measure the DC offset by the method that I showed you previously so we can put the bottom of the tray somewhere where it's convenient and then move it to AC and we see that it dropped by uh, um, so this would be a hundred millivolts so um, 20 40 60 millivolts of DC offset right that's all it has when it comes to DC offset um, and that's about it um, oh there's a magnifier so magnifier means that instead of sweeping the trace um, on this long of a screen it's pretending like the screen is 10 times longer um, and sweeping it at the same speed but because it's sweeping it on 10 times longer surface 10 times longer length you can look at much more detail so you can see now that the position control has a very 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 wide range and if we go to a very short uh, times per division scale you can see that there's a delay between two sweeps as opposed to a normal sweep which starts immediately one after the other in a, in a magnified sweep it does start again right after the one after the other so the sweeps are uh, successive but we're only looking at a very small portion of the sweep so that's about it for a conventional analog oscilloscope now I'm gonna try and show you a analog storage oscilloscope uh, that's about it that we can do with this one these this series of scopes the main the mainframes and the plugins were exceptional they had everything from digital multimeters to spectrum analyzers to optical um, spectrum analyzers to uh, differential amplifiers sampling uh, plugins everything logic analyzers everything you could put put anything into these things and configure them as any instrument you needed but yeah you know these were very very expensive back in the day right I'll uh, reposition to one of the other scopes and let's take a look at analog storage now I don't know how well we're gonna be able to see this because the screen on this scope is a bit faded but I will do my best to make it as uh, easy to see as possible so unfortunately the calibrator for this particular scope is on the back so I'm going to use the one on top so you can see the traces on there it's about as visible as I can make it without sacrificing the tube life any further it's got plenty of tube life left but I would rather not um, kill it because this is a kind of a rare oscilloscope at least in this part of the world so again everything else applies here we should focus the screen um, compensate the probes and um, get to know the scope in general but now we're looking at the calibration output of the scope which is on top another interesting thing these scopes have and the other didn't is they have a time measurement thing so uh, if you take the two knobs here and here I'm not sure how well you're gonna be able to see the dots moving on the display but there's one you can sort of see it down here told you the tube is a bit faded and I can actually make it a bit less a bit more visible if I uh, make it wider and the other one is here and what you can do with these is 
you can measure time between the two markers and it's around there. You can see it written here. Okay, let's look at storage. So what does storage mean? Well, before digital scopes were a thing, people thought about ways of making scopes um, be easier to, you know, uh, making scopes more usable. So in order to help you look at non-repetitive signals, you need some sort of uh, mm, storage. So if you want to look at a signal which you can not really... Uh, wait, let me... because you're very blown out. Just a second. Uh, this kills the two, by the way. So it's meant to last a long time, but still it doesn't do it any good to keep it on storage. So this is analog persistence. So basically what, me what this means is that while the beam is tracing uh the form of the shape of the signal there's also a mesh right behind the phosphors which is being charged by the beam itself uh, and that mesh being charged is then illuminated through two flood guns which are responsible for the general glow of the display and we can tweak that by adjusting these knobs sorry actually these ones so this is the persist persistence time, basically. The brighter, the, the shorter the persistence time, the faster it fades. If we stick it to very long persistence, then it actually it acts like a, you know, a long persistence tube. This is how I did the shorts video. I don't know if you've seen it with the radar display. Okay, so this is um, basically this is slow persistence, and if we want to look at a signal, and I'm disconnecting the probe, I'm actually taking the probe out of the scope, and now we can look at the signal which is stored on the oscilloscope, and it will be stored for quite a while. Um, and you can adjust the levels here, which basically adjust the brightness of the stored waveform. And this is the history. It's actually what's left of the charge of the previous signals. So this is slow storage. And it's good for, you know, you set up your waveform, you capture it. And then you... I apologize if this video is going to look like poop but um, that's the only way I can get reasonable images of out of the, the mm, tube. So you can set your camera on top, uh, take a photo, and then keep going, document your work like a proper engineer. The only difference between uh, science and screwing around is uh, taking notes. Okay, uh, so now if we want to clear, you just hit, hit clear and it cleared the image and that's it. And in case you want to look at a very fast signal, which happens only once in a while, um, what you would need to do is set the oscilloscope to uh, fast persistence, fast storage actually, which is this thing. And now if we clear it, where you can see a lot of ghosting and artifacts, so we need to turn it down and turn the beam intensity up. And turn the level down again. And <clears throat> adjust it and hope for the best. And this is an adequate uh, image. So what happens is in fast storage, it's writing this image all in one shot. So one sweep of the horizontal is one shot of a writing cycle basically so now if I hit it with a single sweep and reset it's going to do a single sweep and then wait it's not going to do anything if you leave it in auto and leave it in fast persistence you when you come back from lunch you won't have an oscilloscope anymore basically because it's not that bad but for old scopes like this with tired tubes it kind of is so 
this is how fast storage works. And it's good for looking at non-repetitive signals or, sig for example, you would trigger something with um, an external trigger or something like that, and then you can hit a uh, uh, single fast slope, um, fast sweep, um, store, and then take a photo and think about why it looks like that for three weeks. Okay, let's put it back to non-storing, and you can see just how far um, the intensity was down almost pretty much all the way. Uh, so that means there still is some life in this tube, but not much. Uh, one more thing that these scopes can do, but this one can't really do it because, I don't know, something's broken in it and I still need to fix a few things in it, but the one on top can do is um, dual time base. So let me show you that, but I'll need to move things around a bit for, for just a second. Right, so some people have called this uh, frame cursed because you know, this oscilloscope didn't have a frame and I 3D printed one. And the dual time base is very interesting. You see that? There's two time base knobs. And if you hit mix and use this cursor, you can look at various parts of the time base and by adjusting the secondary time base, you can look at varying parts of the, um, what do you call it, of the waveform, right? This is really cool. And for example, you can just look at the rising edge or the falling edge or whatever. But at this moment, I'm looking at this signal up to here, and then I'm looking at the next transition up. So this was pretty cool and it's kind of magical. I, I'm not sure exactly how they're doing this. Oh, one more thing I forgot to mention. Um, when you use these sort of scopes in dual channel mode, you have two options. So you have either um, alternate or uh, chopped. So alternate sweep or chopped sweep. Alternate sweeping means that it first sweeps the top trace and then the bottom trace. So it's very easy to see when you're at low um, milliseconds per division settings, right? Uh, and it's beneficial for, in my opinion, or at least what I found so far, it's beneficial for higher frequency signals. If you go to chop, once you go over a specific point, you start seeing artifacts from the chopping. Um, these scopes are pretty good but you can still under certain circumstances see the chopping artifacts. Basically chopping means that it switches very fast between drawing the bottom and the top trace. So I think this would be enough for today. Um, I'll split this into two parts. Um, the second part will be about uh, digital scopes because uh, yeah, I'm kind of teetered out at this point, but I hope you learned a few things and um, hopefully this is a comprehensive guide to how to use analog scopes. I find them completely useless at this point, so there's rare occasions in which a uh, digital sc uh, scope is worse than an analog, sc analog scope, but um, they're just so pretty, so... I don't know, to me, this display is just gorgeous and in traditional tektronic style, the traces are insanely thin and not noisy and these things are built like tanks. The only things that fail in them are the tensile caps, so yeah. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for watching and uh, keep using your old scopes. Bye.